our 2015 Director Designer Showcase presentation. This is going to span the next hour and a half or so. We'll have teams coming in and presenting and going out, and you are welcome to chat with any of the teams you wish to uh, speak with further out in the uh, exhibit area. But before we turn to the designs, I think we need to learn a little bit and give our thanks to the entity that makes possible this Director Designer Showcase. As you know, Opera America is dedicated to identifying and nurturing the next generation of artistic talent. And we do it in many ways through the National Opera Center with recording days, our uh, career blueprint session, uh, recording days at the Opera Center, a lot of it focused on singers. If you've been to the National Opera Center, you know we also have production exhibits because although the Opera Center is very busy with a lot of work emanating from the auditory part of opera, opera is also a visual art form, a theatrical art form. And without brilliant designers bringing opera to life in a visual way, we wouldn't have the success as an art form that we do. Uh, the Tobin Theater Arts Fund um, is based in San Antonio, Texas. And every other year, they support the Tobin uh, Director Designer Showcase because they too are dedicated to design excellence. And although uh, the work that they do at the Mac wonderful McNay Museum uh, showcases celebrated designers, they recognize that you can't have celebrated designers without having young, promising designers. We are so grateful to the Tobin Theater Arts Fund for showcase and here uh, to speak more about the, the foundation and uh, the man who made it all possible is Mel Weingart, the president of the Theater Arts Fund, a great personal friend, a great friend of Opera America, and uh, here today to greet us. Mel. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, this afternoon to share a very few moments to speak about Robert Tobin and his lifelong interest, passion, and a commitment to the art of set and costume design. Robert Tobin spent the major part of his life amassing one of the most prestigious and comprehensive private collections of theater art in the world. And he did so while constantly learning about this art form and with the greatest of taste and elegance. His knowledge of opera and theater was of the highest caliber and he lived his life with that as his primary interest. The Tobin Collection of Theater Arts is one of the most important repository of scene and costume design in the world and it is a highlight of San Antonio's McNay Art Museum. More than 10,000 preliminary sketches, final renderings, maquettes, and illustrated books in this extraordinary collection document the development of European and North American theater design from the 1500s until today. The collection showcases the rich and decorative tradition of Russian stage design represented by Leon Bakst and Natalia Goncharova. British designs range from Edward Gordon Craig's visionary experiments with light and shadow to daring creations by Ralph Koltai. From the simplicity of Robert Inman Jones to the postmodern fragmentation of Adrian Lobel, the collection traces distinctive stylistic contributions by US designers as well. In addition, there is an extensive library of over 2,000 rare volumes, which includes costume encyclopedias as well as festival books. As Robert was amassing his collection out of a fascination with the theater, in particular the musical stage, he also pursued an educational mission. Believing that designs only come to life when used, he made that collection available to students, educators, artists, and the public through the McNay Art Museum. There was no greater champion and supporter to a scenic designer than Robert. He truly believed that all components of designing were the most worthy of art forms and he treated all designers with the highest levels of admiration and respect. Donald Linslager and Ming Cho Lee in describing Robert wrote, and I quote, Robert was a friend of all people who create. 
His taste was broad and eclectic, and he made very few judgments based on trends. So his collection embodies a great range of work. Robert was a person who treated the work, the visual art of performing arts, theater and opera, as a living force, not as dead objects. His collection continues to support it, to speak for it, and to bring young people into the arts. Robert passed away on April 26, 2000, almost 15 years ago to the day. Shortly before his death, Robert and the directors of the Tobin Theater Arts Fund undertook a project to fund the publication of a book on the history of stage de design in Europe and the United States. It took 10 years to accomplish this project, and I'm very pleased to announce that the book has become so popular that it is now in its second printing. The book, uh, the book entitled Making the Scene is co-authored by Dr. Oscar Brockett, Margaret Mitchell, and Linda Hardberger. We are very confident that Robert would have been extremely proud of this work, and we hope that you all will enjoy it as well. A number of years ago, the three directors of the Tobin Theater Arts Fund, Linda Hardberger, Bob Perziola, and I, in an effort to continue to carry on part of Robert's mission, established an annual award in connection with the Theater Development Fund. This award, known as the Robert L. B. Tobin Award for Sustained Excellence in Theatrical Design, acknowledges a designer who has achieved the highest level of excellence throughout his or her career. It symbolizes Robert's passion, respect, and esteem for the art of theatrical design. This year's recipient was Douglas Schmidt, and he was presented with the Robert L. B. Tobin Award for Sustained Excellence in New York City just last week. Approximately eight years ago, Mark Skork and I were having lunch in New York, and Mark spoke with me about what at that time was going to be the possibility of a new project which Opera America wanted to undertake. And when I questioned Mark about some of the details of the project, he explained to me what the goal was, was to assemble teams of directors, set designers, and costume designers. And each of those teams would then submit a concept of a work of an opera that was in the repertory. And once the teams had submitted the original concepts of those designs, a panel of, uh, from Opera America would evaluate, evaluate those uh, initial designs and they would then award those teams uh, a grant to expand their designs. And once uh, that was done, the four teams would then have an opportunity to display their works at the annual conference. Uh, the Opera America conference that year was going to be in Boston. So when I questioned Mark at that time about how many teams had submitted work at that time, he told me initially 42. And I was just shocked that there had been so many. So it didn't take very long for us to decide that we really this was something that Robert really, really would have wanted to do. And as a result of that, that program now has come to be known as the Robert L. B. Tobin Director Designers Showcase. It's unfortunate uh, that Robert passed away before this project was ever fully developed and grew to what it is at the present time. I really can't think of anyone who would be more pleased with the result and to know what an important role he is playing in helping very young, talented designers pursue great careers. Thank you all for giving me the opportunity to visit with you uh, for a few minutes this afternoon, and I hope you enjoy the four displays that you will see. Thank you, Mel, for placing what we're about to do in the broad perspective you did, and again, for your generous support. We have as our master of ceremonies for today's showcase, Walker Lewis. Walker himself was uh, showcased a few years ago uh, in, a, in a winning team, and he's a great friend of Opera America, a wonderful stage director who's doing the apprentice scenes 
this summer at the Santa Fe Opera. Uh, we are so fortunate to have him acting as our MC today. So without further ado, please welcome Walker Lewis. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thanks again to the Tobin Foundation and Opera America for making this showcase possible. Uh, the Tobin Director Showcase, Director Designer Showcase is a biennial program offered as part of Opera America's continuing effort to foster emerging opera artists. The showcase was established to bring promising talent to the attention of the field and connect these directors and designers with those who are in a position to advance their careers. That's all of you guys in the audience. <laughs> 40 applicant teams of directors and designers each created a production concept for an American opera, chosen from a diverse curated list. As part of the application process, each team submitted a production concept that included visions for staging, scenery, props, costumes, and required personnel. The teams being presented today have designed the operas Four Saints in Three Acts, Lizzie Borden, Three Decembers, and The Cradle Will Rock. These four teams were selected by a panel of independent opera designers and production managers, three of whom are with us today. They are Tobin Ost, uh, yes, scenic and costume designer. Uh, Drew Landmesser, Deputy General Director of the Lyric Opera of Chicago. Thank you. And Todd Hensley, the lighting designer and theater planner with Schuler Shook. Over the next two years, each team will also have their designs featured in a six-month exhibition at the National Opera Center in New York. So when you're in the neighborhood, you should drop by and see it. My own personal experience with the showcase has been a very, very positive one. When my team was a finalist in 2013 for our concept of Rise and Fall of the City of Mahagoni, the whole process of preparing and presenting our work had a massive effect on my creative process and, and on my career. It was a wonderful gift and challenge to be given the freedom to dig deeper into the design concept of an opera before committing. Uh, to not have to be satisfied with the first few ideas, but to be able to explore further the layers of meaning hidden in the music and libretto. And to discover as a team the different ways an opera can be brought to life visually. The process is also a valuable lesson in how to persuasively express ideas about design and concept, from discussions within our team and with our mentor to the presentation itself, and with conversations with audience members afterward. Finally, it was a crucial way for us to introduce our work to a wider audience, and the relationships I formed have blossomed into numerous projects and collaborations. So let's get down to business. Each group will have 20 minutes total to present and take questions from the audience. So as, as you're watching, think about what you'd like to ask them. And we'll stri to strive to stay on schedule to ensure that every group gets uh, the maximum amount of time. Starting us off will be the team of Three Decembers with director Joshua Miller. Come on up. Good afternoon. My name is Josh Miller and I'm the director that's had the privilege to work with these fabulous designers that you see here on my left. On behalf of our team, I'd like to take a moment and sincerely thank Opera America and the Tobin Foundation for the honor to be here today presenting our design. We'd also like to thank our mentor, Todd Hensley of Schuler Shook, as well as Larley Everett and all the staff at Opera America for their expertise and assistance in guiding us along this wonderful journey. I'd now like to introduce our team. Designing costumes is Hope Bennett. Our scenic designer is William Anderson. And our media projection designer is Stephanie Busing. 
Our team members have all known each other for about the past four years as we're all recent graduate students uh, at the University of Texas at Austin. Three Decembers is, an, is a piece with emotional depth. It's sincere and it offers many unique design challenges that we were excited to face. The cast is made up of three singers. Madeline Mitchell is our matriarch, is, is a bro an aging Broadway actress. Maddie, as her children call her, provides the audience with both comedic relief and moments of sentimentality. B is Maddie's daughter. She leads what she calls a mundane life, raising a family in the suburbs of Hartford, Connecticut, while also hiding an alcohol dependency. Charlie, Maddie's son, lives in San Francisco with his partner, Bert. The opera begins on Christmas Day, 1986. Charlie and B, on a phone call from opposite sides of the country, are engaged in their holiday ritual of reading and mocking their mother's annual Christmas letter. As brother and sister read on, Maddie appears in flashback, writing the letter while getting dressed for a holiday party in the Barbados. In lies our first design challenge. The opening scene takes place in three different locations. I'm now gonna hand it over to William Anderson to talk about how he worked this challenge into his scenic design. So the challenge of multiple locations happens throughout the entire opera. And the, the story arc and the way that the the story is written out, it was very memory-esque. And these, these locations would be better served if they were sort of a glimpse at what it would be. So we knew immediately we wanted to work with projections so that the spaces were hinting at what the location was, rather than realistically, um, physically showing it, which then allowed us to be able to create more of a psychological environment for the scenery there's so much depth and so much history with these three characters that to psychologically represent that in a space so that you feel what these characters are feeling before you even get to know them was our goal. And so using these big blocks of stone to create the walls and the floor made up of just big blocks of marble. Um, Donald Judd was a huge inspiration in this creation of this sort of stone environment. Each of the three framing parts of the opera, the beginning, middle, and end, take place across three different decades, 1986, 1996, and finally, 2006. This offers a unique challenge for a costume designer who had to represent three different decades of fashion within one through composed opera with no intermission. I'm now gonna hand it over to Hope Bennett, our costume designer, to talk about that cherished historical period that provided us all with lots of <laughs> interesting photos the 1980s. Um, the costumes in the first part of Act One um, in this emotional abstract space, um, the costumes function as our introduction not only to the characters but to the specific timeline of the oh, opera. To the specific timeline of the opera. Um, details like the cut of the Christmas sweaters that B and Charlie wear, um, to their hair, to their jewelry, um, we firmly plant ourselves in, in 1986. Um, their costumes speak of their ties to one another despite their physical appearance, their physical distances. Um, while in contrast, when we meet their mother Madeline in the center in Barbados, we know that she's having a very different Christmas than her children are. <laughs> uh, Maddie's dress is uh, not only on point period for 1986, it also shows her unwillingness to age and be maternal. Still in 1986, our second scene moves us to New York City, to the big Broadway. Maddie has opened a, sh a new show, and B has come down from Hartford for opening night. Charlie, who has a troubled relationship with his mother, has chosen not to attend. As a director, this is one of my favorite scenes. As we, our trio, we, we uh, sorry, uh, our trio, and I was able to work storytelling into our design. In this scene, Maddie is taking off her costume and wig that she wore for her Broadway play. The audience expects Maddie to remove her wig cap and reveal her real hair, but instead she puts on her day wig in order to go greet her fans at the stage door. With the use of this wig, I was able to show that Maddie is in a constant state of theatricality. In fact, at the end of the opera, we learned that Maddie, Maddie's need to constantly believe in the imaginary crushes her children's reality. I'm now gonna pass the baton to Stephanie Busing, our projection designer, to talk about how we adjusted our design after receiving feedback from our initial application materials. So we decided to close the scene off significantly, both scenically and with projections. This is the only moment of the piece where we have chosen not to have rear projection. We have 
uh, some projection across the header, as you can see there. It's a very light hint at a Broadway dressing room, light bulbs. But this is a very intimate scene between Bea and her mother. Um, Bea is desperately wanting her mother to accept Charlie's lifestyle and to tell the truth about their father's death. But of course, being as stubborn as she is, Maddie is completely unrelenting here. The last scene in 1986 takes place on the Golden Gate Bridge as Charlie and Bea reflect back on the life of their father who died in a car accident while they were both still toddlers. William is going to walk us through this transition from New York City to the Golden Gate Bridge. So we have these big blocks of stone that can shift and transform the space that, as you saw previously, can bring us down to a very intimate, closed-off space and then immediately juxtapose it to actually one of the really intimate brother-sister scenes, but opening up the space into a very vast landscape. And, and here we actually do have some hint at real world um, physicality. We're supposed to be on the Golden Gate Bridge, but instead of literally doing a Golden Gate Bridge, it's more just representational as, uh, gold, as uh, red cables that are coming in. Part two takes place in 1996. Like the opening, we're again in three different locations. Charlie is in San Francisco mourning the loss of his partner, Bert, while Maddie, who is 3,000 miles away in New York, is simultaneously feeling her son's pain and is singing him the lullaby that she sang to him when his father died. Our next scene takes place on June 2nd, 1996. It's the night of the Tony Awards and Maddie has been nominated. Interesting real life facts, Nathan Lane was the host, Rent won Best Musical, and Terrence McNally won Best Play for Masterclass. As you may know, Three Decembers is also based on Terrence McNally's play, Three De uh, Some Christmas Letters. Charlie and Bea are waiting in Maddie's apartment for her to return from her nail appointment. In this scene, Charlie and Bea are going through their mother's closet. Producers in the room don't worry. With our design, you don't have to buy the 500 pairs of designer shoes that are mentioned in the libretto. We just projected them on the closet. You're welcome. <laughs> but Hope will tell you more about the designer gowns that the characters will wear at the Tony Awards. Sure. For storytelling and subtext through costume, this is my favorite scene. Um, Maddie's closet was just a delight to design, not only because of the research involved, but the specifics that are talked about in the libretto. Um, Dior is a running theme, which is, of course, something that any designer would just be over the moon to do. And that was also exciting because 1996, there was a shift in color and silhouette because the fashion house changed designers that year. Um, and the scene B is trying on gowns of her mother's, um, which can be vintage or replica, replica of any year prior to 1996. Um, and I've done both here with, on the left, B's copy of a 1993 gown and Madeline's composite in the center of classic Dior shape with the contemporary color and accessories. Um, B tries on a, a great number of dresses and rejects them as she sings of her mother's absence. Um, again, <laughs> one dress B will try on and linger in is found in the libretto, the Black Dior. And it's similar in shape to Maddie's choice here as she prepares for the award ceremony. And it's a gown that we will see later in the opera at a different kind of ceremony. Like Hope, this would also be one of my favorite scenes, but to direct. I want Charlie and B to channel their inner children, jumping on the bed while playing dress up with their mother's clothes. This will set up the show's plot twist. In this scene, we learn that Maddie uh, has been lying to her children. Their father did not die in an automobile accident, but instead was a depressed alcoholic that threw himself in front of a subway train. Maddie justifies pulling Charlie and B into her theater by saying she couldn't play the role of a mother with two small children abandoned by a husband who took his own life. Here are our siblings playing dress up and jumping on the bed, now being thrown back in time and learning the real truth about their father. The scene ends with Charlie and B storming out and Maddie, Maddie putting on her Tony Awards gown. She takes a moment to look at herself in the mirror, wigless and raw. This scene transitions seamlessly into part three. It's now 2006, and it's the day of Maddie's funeral. In her will, she has requested that Charlie and B hold her memorial service on a Broadway stage. Charlie tells the crowd that 8 p.m. was Maddie's favorite moment, when curtains are raised. Suddenly, Maddie appears on the bridge platform, angelically looking over her children. And for, 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 go ahead, go, go ahead. <laughs> for Madeline's final performance, uh, she wears a gown that's an echo of her best era. It's, um, it's a desaturated copy of the one that she wore on the Broadway stage in the 80s. Um, we've updated her hair and her makeup to show the 20 years that have passed. Um, 
the B wears the black Dior that she rejected in part two that I just spoke of. Um, so she's forging a relationship with her mother after her mother's death with this reveal of her belongings and showing a belated acceptance and understanding for her mother's unique way of showing love. Thank you, Hope. <laughs> uh, the final moment of the opera is a simple one. Charlie told us that Maddie loved it when curtains were raised at 8 p.m. Here, Maddie looks at the audience and speaks the word curtain. Now, you would expect the main show curtain to drop downstage, but instead... A curtain is raised, a digital curtain, and we reveal a live video feed of our audience. This would be the audience that is actually watching the performance in the space. Maddie is silhouetted against this projection as she descends a staircase behind the scenery to greet her last audience for her final major performance. This is a great moment of absolution in this play for these characters. B and Charlie are closer than ever, and Maddie has finally relinquished the secret about their father and has, has accepted her children for who they are. Again, on behalf of the designers on this project, I'd like to thank Opera America and the Tobin Foundation for giving us this amazing opportunity. And we thank each of you for being here for our presentation. We look forward to meeting you in the exhibit hall so that we can show you even more details about our design. Finally, we'll leave you with a brief animation of Three Decembers. Thank you. What a beautiful presentation. So, any uh, questions from the audience for these uh, creators? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Mike in a box. Okay, I'm just wondering what this sorry. is. Okay. <laughs> is this a game? Very okay. Um, sorry. Um, Stephanie, I have a question about the projection. Sure. So, some of us, as much as we love this, are not equipped yet mm -hmm. to do this. Have you, have you kind of vetted out the costs of that, of being able to do something like this? Yes, and I have, a, I have a spreadsheet that delineates all of those costs. Um, it depends on the space, honestly, how big the space is. But if, if it were the right space, then this could be done with two projections or projectors, and it could be rented out. Um, it wouldn't be something that would have to be in-house. Uh, the front projector would have to be a little bit brighter, so it would be a more expensive cost. But this space is actually quite large, so I spec'd out three projectors for the rear. Um, but it could be done in, with one if need be. And rental costs are getting to the point where it's doable, especially if the long isn't it really, really long. The run is not very long. So I hope that answers your question. But if, if you have more specific questions, I can certainly help with that at the table outside. Okay. Other questions? Other questions, oh. sir? Here, Blue jacket. Pass that. That was a bunch of questions, but just as a fellow UP alum, I just want to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <Come on>. <laughs> 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 Always room for celebration. We like, we like Any other questions? <laughs> Any other questions for the team? Great. Challenges? <laughs> no? No challenges? 
All right. Oh, here's one in the back, sir. Uh, so the scenic pieces are a combination of fly, uh, the fly system that was given to us and uh, wagons. What was the space that was provided by uh, The glimmer glass space? Yeah. So it was operated by Jake Nixon? Yes, yeah. There was nothing in there that couldn't be done with most uh, fly systems um, or just wagons that can roll on. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Three December's team. Well done. <laughs> And uh, just to reiterate, uh, the teams afterward will be out there with their models and renderings if you want to ask them any more questions. So next group up is Four Saints in two acts. Three. Three acts, sorry. What's an act here or there? Uh, with director Mary Birnbaum. Thanks so much for having us today, and thanks to Opera America for letting us participate in this. We're so excited to be here. Um, I'm Mary Birnbaum, director of Four Saints and Three Acts, and these are my three saints. Hi, I'm Grace Laubacher, and the set designer. Moria Clinton, costume designer. I'm Anshuman Bhatia, the lighting designer. Uh, and missing today is Adam Cates, a choreographer. Um, so I just wanted to, to talk about Four Saints and give it a little bit of context uh, with, with a quick anecdote. Um, our mentor, David O. Roberts, uh, costume designer, said to me, oh my god, don't you love Four Saints? It's about nothing. Uh, to which I responded, yes, but it's about everything. Um, Gertrude Stein and Virgil Thompson's modernist vaudeville lionizes people who live their lives as contradictions, devoutly religious yet sometimes ostracized from the church, ascetic and sedentary despite their rich and active internal lives. Stein's obtuse gymnastic language paired with Thompson's naive and thoroughly American music illustrates this discord with effects both shocking and hilarious. In 1934, the original production of Four Saints felt like the beginning of modernism in America. Um, John Houseman actually directed this production. Sir Frederick Ashton choreographed it. The sets were by Florine Stettheimer, uh, who was a, a very famous painter, and it featured an all-black cast. Uh, for the first time on Broadway, there was a show that was not directly about black life featuring a, a black cast. So we searched for a way to present the show that would be as titillating and rebellious as that, that original staging. Um, and in 2015, theatrical casting is meaningfully and purposefully diverse. And since the rise and fall of postmodernism, logic and language have been definitively divorced. So we thought that there would be nothing more jarring to, to uh, Stein and Thompson than to place the show squarely within their time period, to juxtapose their experiments against the backdrop uh, that they were fighting, really. Um, our production is a pageant as American as Thompson's music rooted in the vaudeville theater of the 1930s. The tableau vivants of the Follies, the gestural acting of post Bernhardt divas, and primitive technical theater magic. On stage is a proscenium theater wherein the scenes from the lives of the saints are playfully depicted, replete with charming historical inaccuracies. This is a church of art where chorus girls and boys portray saints and collaborate with stagehands to create a show and inspire the suspension of disbelief. Here, theatrical magic stands in for divinity. There's even an onstage audience for the play, uh, an elderly couple, the Comer and Compere, who are constantly trying to make sense out of what's before them, rifling through their programs to find out what scene they're in. Um, we, are, we watch the Comer and Compere uh, watch a play, but also we're aligned with them, delighted to find that we pageantry. We drew from, from meta-theatrical portraits of Sarah Bernhardt and such Ziegfeld stars as the Cutter Sisters, as well as stylized but imaginative drawings of Erte. Featuring ostentatious headdresses and bare skin, this ideal of beauty is lush, Edenic, and plumpness. Vintage Catholic saint paper cards and gilded statues highly influenced the palette with lots of gold and sepia flavored jewel tones, pictured in a world of silk charmeuse and patinaed sequins. The first scene of the show takes place downstage of a drop that shows the outside of the rather dingy theater and the stage door. Um, this is a place of popular entertainment. It's not for high art. Um, the name of the show has been uh, haphazardly applied to the marquee 
And um, the outside foyer and ticket area are plastered with peeling signage from previous performances. Uh, cut out uh, openings in the drop uh, allow characters to enter and exit physically through the stage door and the front door of the theater. Now, just before showtime, and patrons are trickling into the theater, two girls, two showgirls wearing burnished sequin bikinis and gifted fur coats are smoking and gossiping outside the stage door. The stage manager pokes his head out and calls 10 minutes. A stage door Johnny, in his best duds, enters with some flowers, excited to see St. Teresa for the 10th time. We hear the audience gossip about their expectations of the show. Prepare for saints. What happened today? A narrative? Last of the theater is an elderly couple with traditional theatrical taste, the Comer and Compere. I imagined them as a... <laughs> I imagine them as an older couple, steady patrons, trying to figure out what they're seeing, telling it to each other, maybe a little hard of hearing, maybe talking too loudly, and maybe arguing, <laughs> all the while filling us in. Like they just stepped out of a Vivian Mayer photograph, honest and identifiable, an absurdist comedy all their own. Her in her sad mank, him in his drunk bow tie, carrying their opera glasses and their sugar-free candies. <laughs> As it nears showtime, a chorus member and a, bla a backstage crew guy blush at each other bashfully. Another stagehand desperately wants to be an actor. An understudy is told she's going on tonight. All the audience enters the theater and the stage manager calls the chorus girls in. Finally, the performance is ready to begin. The drop flies away and we're looking at the house of the theater. Understudy checks her line on stage. And the stage manager says, Great. Uh, at the end of the prologue, the lights come up on the steps of the Avila Cathedral. Um, the cathedral door has been reimagined as a freestanding Art Deco portal and it's standing at the top of several tiered levels. Um, the space is framed by legs and borders that are scene painted to look like foliage, uh, recalling a pre-modern design aesthetic. Um, the painted drop of the sky is slightly wrinkled and it's sort of imperfectly hung, as though it was, sort of, it was pulled out of storage a few hours ago. And uh, the steps are painted with a dense carpet of lavender flowers. At the beginning of the show, the, lightning, the lighting is strictly period. The incandescents footlight glow warmly, and offstage we feel the strained coolness from carbon arc lamps. When the curtain raises on Act 1, the chorus girls are splayed adoringly in a Busby Berkeley-esque formation around Teresa 1, who is sanctimoniously writing down her thoughts. The onstage blocking begins as a tightly ordered machine, highly choreographed and representational. The ensemble saints earnestly replay St. Teresa's life in Avila, avoiding camp, but occasionally, occasionally stumbling into the ridiculous. There's a brief ballet of all the visits St. Teresa goes on, which the understudy enters late. She doesn't quite know the choreography and goes in the wrong direction. St. Teresa 1 is dismayed. Then St. Teresa 2 enters, who is a man. <laughs> there is a battle of the diva actors, who can steal more focus through his and her or her extravagant gestural acting. The stage door Johnny screams brava and flowers are thrown from the audience and wings. Then St. Saint Ignatius comes in. Introducing St. Ignatius. <laughs> In his laid back but sexy, Jesus like, metallic toga. <laughs> I pictured him wooing the Teresas with his guitar. Everyone goes into this sort of trance and frenzy in reaction to his swooniness. Then there's a series of tableaus Ignatius meeting both Teresas, Ignatius playing guitar, Ignatius giving flowers to Teresa too, both Teresas fighting over Ignatius an angel visiting St. Teresa I, who tells her to forget about Ignatius and come with him. Then St. Teresa II, improbably with child. <laughs> Finally, all of them bow, and that's the end of Act I. <laughs> Act II begins, and we move to Barcelona, which looks exactly like Avila. <laughs> 
Uh, the setting here is a garden party, uh, and so a few handfuls of leaves flutter to the ground um, at the top of the act, uh, and then two dozen roses come in to rest overhead, um, over the actors' heads. Um, and in the borders and legs, uh, several hatches open up, and out of them pop some 2D painted birds. We see St. Chavez, our ringleader, maybe organizing some party games, bossing around the menagerie of other saints. In our four saints, there is no gender or race divide. Artists like Josephine Baker and period female impersonators like Barbette Dressing and Harry S. Franklin influenced our myriad of showgirls and boys. <laughs> Each saint has their own signature costume to represent their individual flamboyant act. Each tries to upstage one another as bigger and grander, scandally clad saints. Once all the saints are assembled, there is the dance of the angels, where all the saints watch two dancers on point. They grab flowers from the sky and dance with them. The chorus girl stagehand relationship heats up here, and St. Teresa too does a moving interpretive dance. Act three takes place at a Spanish port. Uh, the pieces from before remain on stage, but two of the actors unfurl a large scene-painted wave, which transforms the stage into a seascape. Um, at this point, the rules and the norms of 1930s theater have sort of stopped working, and um, the abstract is starting to take over in a sort of unexpectedly beautiful way. The systematic tightness of the lighting begins to fall apart. The green of the carbon arcs micro stronger, or perhaps someone is even left in the dark. And in Thompson's plaintive music, we hear a more contemplative, sadder side of the saints' lives, the solitude. Suddenly, a heavenly visitation occurs. <laughs> At which point, birds pop up from the ocean, and this woman painted gold rises. At this point, the Comair and Compare are totally bored. Uh, they keep asking when the torture will end and how many acts are there in it. Then, of course, there's a dance break. It begins with our vaudevillian-style dancing couples performing a theatricalized Argentine tango. As it continues, the Comair and Compare and the rest of the audience get in on the action and come to the stage. Uh, the final act takes place in heaven, and the space becomes totally chaotic and illogical. <laughs> um, at the top of act four, um, the foliage becomes bedecked with stars, and this art deco halo descends to frame the cathedral door. The lighting grows warmer and even more lovely, and at the end of the piece, a heavenly glow emanates from the stage. We see St. Ferdinand bathed in glitter, a romantic warrior readying to shoot down the moon. And as his arrow flies, a stagehand takes his cue to lower a large cutout sliver of a moon, which is suspended on hemp ropes. And finally, Saint Plan, maybe male, maybe female, and her maps are navigating the stars. Now the established order is so confused that audience and artists alike are forced to join Stein and Thompson in their celebration of the essential, illogical nature of art, life, and God. The strict boundary between actor and audience dissolves. Some of the showgirls wind up in the actual opera house. The house lights come up to reveal humanity everywhere. We all concede that shows can have three acts, but also five acts. And it's actually in life's contradiction that we can find God. Thompson and Signs show us that the divine both is and is not a fact. Uh, thanks so much for, for taking the time to listen to us today. Um, you can find us outside afterwards. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, any questions for this team? Any questions? <laughs> well, it's actually all in one act, the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> yes, anyone else? Yes, ma'am. That's the hope always, right? Um, yeah, here, definitely. Definitely. Dance around, hopefully. All right, thank you very much.
Excellent, excellent job. And now for something completely different, the team of Lizzie Borden, Andreas Hager, director. Hi, uh, welcome everybody. I'm Andreas Hager, the uh, stage director for Lizzie Borden. Um, joining me, I have Solomon Weisberg, our lighting designer, Kate Knoll, our set designer, and Seth Bode, our costume designer. Um, now, Lizzie Borden is really still a huge figure in American folklore. Um, these images might be familiar. That's Lizzie Borden. Um, you see her in a children's rhyme that's still prevalent, TV series, movies, all over the internet. Um, but what's important to remember is in the 1890s, this was the trial of the century. 100 years later, um, the O.J. Simpson trial is kind of the similar thing. Lizzie Borden's trial exposed um, a whole facet of American life that nobody had seen before. This is about gender. A woman, could a woman commit this crime? That was the big question. And a jury of peers decided that no, she could not. All right. I guess that's me. So to, <laughs> to put Lizzie in a little bit of context, uh, what Beeson has done is started off the opera with a chorus of children, the children of Fall River, Massachusetts, a mill town a place not necessarily known for its panache or its elegance, certainly. <laughs> um, so here are the children in their sort of homespun garments. And they are accompanied by Reverend Harrington, who is a very decent man of the cloth, who um, is there with Lizzie and her sister. <laughs> OK. There's there with Lizzie and her That's sister Margaret. score. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the dissonance is important. Um, <laughs> So when it comes to Lizzie and her sister Margaret, uh, we're talking about two women who are sort of uh, the penultimate example of the repressed Victorian woman. Uh, and I imagined their clothes to be homespun, definitely homemade. Uh, it becomes a point of contention with Lizzie, actually, that she needs a new dress, and her father denies her the right to go and buy a new dress. And we'll see a little bit later on what his solution to that problem is. So Lizzie and her sister Margaret are in uh, you know, beautiful calicos from the local mills of Fall River that have sort of looked like they've, you know, gotten a little age in them. Uh, work clothes. Uh, Lizzie herself is in her father's work sleeves that he would use at his ledger. Uh, and Margaret is in her calico apron there. Andrew, their father, is in what would be, you know, deemed the respectable, staid clothing of a man of his age and wealth and uh, position in the town. Uh, they also have, you know, Andrew himself has sort of a, a, a muster of, uh, of, of sad, tainted propriety, which will come across sort of in the, uh, I believe, the casting of this villain. Uh, and he has married this woman, Abigail, who was the former maid in the house. And um, depending on how you cast, Abigail could possibly be the same age as Lizzie and Margaret in that realm, or slightly older, but certainly has been freed of the trappings of sort of menial life and is showing it in her garments. So here she is in this changeable taffeta jacket and bustle skirt with sort of all of the trimmings. And then later on, uh, she comes down the stairs with her hair down and her negligee and corset, satins and laces and sheer gossamery things, candlelit. Um, ready to embarrass the two daughters and take Andrew back upstairs to their bedroom. Uh, and then, of course, there is the young love interest, Jason McFarland, which you know causes a great deal of psychological grief between the two sisters. And then, finally, Elizabeth is preparing um, this wedding dress, which was her dear departed mother's wedding dress that she's sort of, it was a wedding dress of the 1870s, think when Victoria and Alberts were sort of in their high reign and everything was ruffles and organdy and she sort of has fit it down to feel a little bit more contemporary to the period of 1890 so you know 20 some years later and uh, this is unfortunately the dress that she 
does the deed in. So, in the penultimate scene. On to you, Kate. Uh, great. So, um, my inspiration for the set of Lizzie Borden is the actual house of Lizzie Borden, which you can actually go visit because it's a bed and breakfast now. <laughs> um, for fans of uh, death, 19th century uh, murders, you, you know, you can go and visit it. And you so can luckily, do weddings there. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so luckily there's lots of pictures of this pretty typical Victorian house. It's actually kind of more of a colonial house, typical of like this puritanical period, which makes sense since Andrew's like a very, has a very puritanical mentality, not in the religious sense, but in the sort of orderliness, um, which is sort of driving everyone insane as well. Um, so the house um, has this Victorian order, all the, all the details and the woodwork and the beams and the the uh, the the, uh, the the balustrade and the steps and the front door and all that stuff. All this stuff is very real. Um, what is not real is the perspective and the <laughs> angles and the shape of the space is incredibly distorted. Um, the architecture is very unstable. Actually, all the I've made it so that all the the rooms sort of converge in in crazy ways that wouldn't really be structurally sound and it's all very unstable, feels like it could fall. The floorboards are, if you look in the model, you'd see that the, if you look closely, the floorboards are all sort of diving it, driving into each other and pinching and coming out and it sort of uh, looks like they could, you know, snap at any second. Um, and there's deep corners in each, each room and everything is sort of coming to a point. There's a lot of tension happening and this is sort of, in a way, for the house to reflect the pressures of Lizzie's mind. Um, and we, I want it to look, have the real, real bits to it, but have this really um, uh, sense that we're an expressionistic space of, from Lizzie's perspective, the pressure of that. If, if I may, this is also something that's mirrored very closely in the score, which has a chromaticism it'll take a melody and just keep making it more and more foreign and bizarre as the opera continues going on. Yeah, there's this tension between the kind of naturalism of the space and the kind of potential for extremity and expression. And that's true in the lighting too. You know, there's this idea of the light coming from the window. The, the place starts, or the opera starts with a, with a really uh, naturalistic feeling room. And then over time, that expression can take over. We get inside her head and, and there's great potential as with the music, the lighting can change immensely. Um, so, wait, what's that? Uh, that's maybe the one. Oh, it might be a different, anyway, <laughs> next thing we have on our list is the, uh, the bedroom. There's a few scenes that are set in, in Lizzie and Margaret's private space, which is, we thought, their bedroom. Um, and, uh, so even though, so it's a separate space, but it's still under the jurisdiction of Andrew Borden's house. So it still has this sort of creepy angle to it and these sort of extreme perspectival lines. Um, and what I actually uh, really loved about the actual, if you look at the actual picture of the research of, uh, of, these, of this house, there are these crazy beds in the house with these gigantic dark headboards that loom in these the rooms are a lot smaller than this, but these beds just sort of take over a room. And I thought that was just a fabulous image just coming from the real house itself and said a lot about, uh, you know, the, the overbearing <laughs> Victorian mentality of these, these people in this time. Um, so these two beds are sitting in this space side by side, looming high at a high, you know, sort of, it's a little exaggerated, um, level that's sort of looking out, looking over Lizzie and her sister at all times, even though they're in their private space, there are these two dark figures like Andrew and Abigail and sort of lording their tyranny over them, even in their private space. And what I love about the, the space that Kate's made also is that these two beds kind of feel like an orphanage, right? So you're getting the sense that these are, these are two girls wi uh, without real parents or without the support of a real family. Great. Yeah. So this is the madness scene. Lizzie comes down wearing her her um, her mother's dress, and it's this this kind of uh, uh, evolution into um, 
and into her mind. So we're pulling down, we're sucking in. There's, there's great potential for the lighting to kind of suck in and go inside her mind in, a, in that way. Um, and then I think then uh, and then we have. Uh, so another thing that I wanted to say is that um, also in this set, there's you always see Andrew and mostly Abigail descending from these staircases, coming down from above, going up to this space above that is inherently theirs in the house, at least in this set. Um, so there's a hierarchy in the space, um, much like you know Electra or Salome. There's sort of this up upstairs and downstairs, and Lizzie and her sister are always downstairs. So we have this staircase, which is, you know, iconic in this, in this whole story. Um, and so after this madness scene where we're sort of intimately, uh, you know, in Lizzie's head, all of a sudden this staircase lights up and, and, and actually the wall is translucent. So you see this sort of dagger axe shape sort of that's red of all things sort of slicing and hatching into the space of the house. Um, in the nature of even what it just is. Um, and uh, that's the moment that Lizzie decides to trespass into the upstairs sanctuary of her parents' hypocrisy <laughs> to some extent. Um, and so it sort of highlights, literally highlights the trajectory of her intention, this sort of, you know, of the deed she is about to do. She grabs <laughs> an ax from the hall on the way up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, sorry, these are out of order. So then when she gets to the top, not only do we see the transparency in this staircase, but as she gets to the top, the roof of the, oh my gosh, the, the ceiling of this room becomes semi-transparent. We're actually able to see some of the uh, images of the violence happening up there. It's obscured, it's shapes, it's shadows, it's in step with the expression of the music. And we see some of this, some of this drama happening um, with even pools of blood and the and the color that, that's created from that. Yeah, it becomes an incredibly surreal space the farther we get into Lizzie's madness, and we become that much more scared for Andrew when he comes back home only to find find blood all over his daughter's his wife's blood all over his daughter's dress. Um, so yes, that happens, and then. <laughs> And, and then, then, yeah, go ahead. And then we flash forward until after the trial. Um, Lizzie has been found innocent, and she's basically now a, uh, a prisoner in her own home because the society has rejected her. Yeah, so even though she, she participated in this kind of great act of liberation, right, she's, she's, she's in a way uh, defeated her circumstances, she's still very much in that, and she has to live with the kind of pain and, um, and oppression uh, that continues. And even though she's been, you know, acquitted of the crime, she's still condemned by society. And uh, so therefore, I think that the idea is that she's sort of locked herself up in her house and uh, she's, the ivy has sort of grown over the window. There she's, she's curtained in her, the walls and it's very dark in there and, and we have this sort of sterile lighting from above that's sort of institutional and all the furniture that was any kind of sentimental is gone. And, uh, and yeah, and so we sort of see her in this sad state that even though she's, she's, she's not convicted or in jail, she's in her own, own prison. Which unfortunately, as we we're much discussing, is the fact that she was hurt, the sexism of that time is what led her to be free so she's still, a, you know, victim of that time. What, what was the term? But she's still a victim of that, <laughs> of the sexism that she was trying to break free from. <laughs> exactly, and I think what makes this opera so amazing is that you take this character who starts off very pious. She's the good girl. She helps the church, and all she wants to do is to be able to go to this dance, meet a husband, and instead she has all these pressures from her tyrannical father to this feud with her stepmother to really wanting, she really wants her sister's man as well. And all these things combine together to turn her into this ax murderer. But at the same time, we're able to keep her a sympathetic character. We're able to understand what's going on in her head. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great job.
Any questions for the team? Yes, ma'am. It's instrumental at that point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that could be achieved with body doubles too or whatever is needed. Any other questions? Yes, Ned. In that same moment, so is the glass something that can be stood on or is that projected on there? Yeah, it's it's structural. I think that the, the rake of it is such that it's it, it wouldn't really be, and I, at the same time, the singer of Lizzie Borden would have to be changing out of a regular sure. wedding dress into a bloody dress. So we were thinking that there would actually be body doubles or even dancers who could deal with that rake and do some sort of physical movement on it. But I think the idea is that it would be a real set of bodies on there um, just to get, I think the lighting, you know, you'd, it'd be like a muffled, muffled violence in a way, which is even creepier because our imagination right. will take over at that point. Um, yeah, but yeah so it would be double. So <laughs> we're, and we're embracing that it could be obscured, so if there needed to be more framing or whatever, there are yeah. considerations that could be adapted to. Yeah. But it all depends on the singer's Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is that a signal we're all going to do? It's all yeah, through the windows. It's all through the windows. <laughs> Anyone else? Excellent. Great job. Thanks so much. Thank Terrific. Thank you. And now, last but not least, we have the team from Cradle Will Rock with director Allison Moritz. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to introduce the rest of our team. This is Charles Murdoch Lucas, scenic designer, Dina Perez, costumes, and Kyle Grant, lighting designer. Oh, how do we click over into our presentation? There we go. <clears throat> um, our presentation today will begin with a brief overview of our concept, and then together we're going to present a storyboard with our approach to individual scenes. So, I am a product of my time, and my time is one of urgency and direct communication in the arts. This quote from composer and librettist Mark Blitzstein has become our team's manifesto. <laughs> Presenting opera today is a socially relevant act, and our strategy for increasing civic impact boils down to just one, thr one thing, creating stories that are products of and for our own time. Less than a month ago, on April 15th, activists in more than 200 United States cities participated in the Fight for 15 campaign to raise the living wage, resulting in the largest ever mobilization of United States workers seeking higher pay. Our proposal for the Cradle of Rock emphasizes the remarkable prescience of Blitzstein's original 1937 version we propose a modern production built upon the scaffolding of the original text and music. The Cradle of Rock is structured as a series of vignettes. Um, during a union protest in Steeltown, USA, members of Mr. Mister's so-called Liberty Committee, sound familiar, <laughs> are mistakenly rounded up and taken into a night court. We learn their backstories in a series of flashbacks that take us to various locations in Steeltown over a period of a roughly 20 years. Blitzstein's musical treatment of these transitions is incredibly cinematic, often in implying a jump cut, a crossfade, a close up, or even a split screen. Our production uses the central themes of Blitzstein's work, including the stratification of society and a massive engine of labor that powers progress to motivate a design that's theatrical to, and an equivalent to cinematic, cinematic conventions. We're creating visual connections between Blitzstein's original text and the social unrest that we've all been witnessing in the past year. We call it a state of a union address that's also the state of our art. Specifically, we drew inspiration from three major sources. The vaudevillian roots of the piece, its kinetic energy, ingenuity, and modularity. Pyramids, triangles, and other diagrams of social hierarchies 
and modern monoliths with an implied sense of motion, such as this photograph by Idris Khan. Here you can see an isometric view of the unit set, with certain areas made translucent for clarity. The layered surround is composed of walls made of OSB, which is an inexpensive engineered wood product, construction scaffolding, and corrugated clear PVC panels. The multiple levels recall the stratified economics of society in both Blitzstein's and our time. The central engine is a two-ring revolve which is used in multiple configurations. Each ring has a half cylinder of walkable and climbable levels. The two halves rotate independently and reconfigure to represent different parts of Steeltown, USA. From the massive factory of labor that functions like a treadmill to the three-story swimming pool for Mr. And Mr.'s home. The turntables are operated by a combination of automation and an on-stage union deck crew costumed to match Larry Foreman and other union labor characters. The characters in this world are archetypes that modern audiences will instantly recognize. The characters are named after their occupations. So we have characters like Larry Foreman, Reverend Salvation, Dr. Specialist, and so on. So the costumes reflect different ideas of the modern uniform that are visual equivalents to their naming devices. At the bottom of our social pyramid, we have uh, Larry Foreman in the working class world that are all wearing variations of their uniform. It's all functional, utilitarian, well-worn clothing. At the middle of the pyramid, we see how the middle class is drawing inspira aspirations from the top of the pyramid. With the Liberty Committee, you can see influences of high fashion through the use of artificial structure, graphic patterns, bold colors. And then at the very top, crowning the pyramid, we have Mr. Mister, who owns most of Steeltown and his family. They are archetypes with the modern twist, the ultimate businessman, the lady who lunches, and their two spoiled brats, materialistic paragons of the American dream. So overall, costumes combine contemporary clothing with period influences that are reminiscent of the narrative's earlier era. Mark Blitzstein said, the middle class must sooner or later see that there can be allegiance only to the future, not to the past. That the only sound loyalty is to the concept of work and to a principle which makes honest work at least true, good, and beautiful. When we first see our show curtain, it's blasted with red light like a more traditional vaudeville curtain. Through a change in lighting, we reveal that we are, in fact, in a construction zone. In this production, functionality is an aesthetic in its own right. For example, the surround walls I mentioned earlier that are made of OSB. Well, OSB is made of millions of pieces of pulverized wood pulp that are compressed to make a stronger whole, just like Mark Blitzstein's central conceit of five fingers closing to make a fist. In the opening scene, Maul, just like every other character in the show, is selling herself. She appears in a narrow steel town alley created by an opening in the corrugated PVC panels. Our construction zone light illuminates the action, again referencing the vaudevillian and burlesque heritage of the opera. The protagonist, Maul, incorporates elements of both the aspiring middle class and the working class world. Through Maul's eyes, we learn about Mr. Mister and his liberty committee. Police open the downstage panels, revealing the engine that is stalled by protesting union workers, while the Liberty Committee is led downstage as Maul watches. The singer playing Larry Foreman will announce the scene changes, and the costume deck crew will be indistinguishable from the ensemble of singing union workers. Our collaborative discussions frequently turn to the ongoing labor negotiations at the Metropolitan Opera this past summer, and how this debate could be represented on stage. By having costumed union crew workers complete the onstage tra transitions as part of the performance itself, we feature the labor typically hidden behind the scenes as skillful and artful in its own right. As a team, we are concerned not only with creating a vivid work of art, but also with featuring the art of work necessary to support an opera production. So here we go into the night court, and this is our first big reveal uh, into the set sort of showing all of its teeth. And uh, the, the major points here are the, the practical lights built into the set that perform important narrative functions and they help us with the temporal part of the storytelling. They are this, um, these uh, red neon lights around the perimeter here, these sort of holding cells inspired by Amsterdam's red light district. 
A lighting truss overhead, it provides this tremulous glow, creating a high ceiling for the bureaucratic goings on of the night court. And then the rest of the under platform construction lights, uh, which tie in. These, um, did I skip? No. This is our first flashback into uh, Harry Druggist, his drugstore. And we had met Harry in the present day in the night court. And he's a vagrant, sort of getting arrested once a week. He refuses to sell out to Mr. Mister, slowly has everything taken away from him. So flashback six months prior, and the drugstore is presented as a vignette of Harry's American dream, a little corner of the world that he gets to call his own. The central engine, the central engine then reconfigures, delivering a shop counter for the drugstore, and practical lights fly in from overhead. Throughout the opera, elements are flown in. The elements that are flown in are used to represent the gentrification of the various corners of Steeltown. And this is a chance for us to really pull down and have an intimate moment in the presence of all the, the structure and the movement that we've seen so far. Harry's slice of American life has sort of been quiet and uninterrupted until this moment. So in the scene, we, we have Harry and his son, Stevie. They were once aspiring members of the middle class. We also have drugstore patrons, Gus and Sadie. They give us a fleeting glimpse of the hope and the promise of the American dream. Finally, when the anti-union henchmen blow up the drugstore, we see a flash of the explosion covering the stage in shadows of debris, using the structure of the machine itself to imply its own destruction. This next sequence pays homage to the show's vaudevillian roots. Yasha and Dauber play in front of the construction show curtain and are lit by industrial footlights as if part of a vaudeville act. Their costumes reinterpret the formal orchestra tuxedo as well as the artist's smock. Additionally, members of the Liberty Committee will have stylized makeup that darkens and hollows their eyes, an idea that, we were, that influenced us with 1930s photographs, but also communicates to the audience that these members of the committee have sold their soul and moral values away to Mr. Mister. As the artists enter the panel, enter through the panels, they enter the ritziest hotel lobby in Steeltown and mingle with Mrs. Mister, their much beloved and much resented patroness. At the end of this scene, a glitter bomb of mylar confetti will explode, reflecting everything that is flat, shiny, vapid, and obnoxious about this art that Mrs. Mister patronizes. So Mrs. Mister's look updates a 1930s silhouette the hot pink leopard print, the exaggerated feather sleeves, and gratuitous diamond chains are undeniably self-indulgent. Then as we transition back to night court, we'll see an immediate contrast between the highs and the lows of society. Labor workers will emerge with push brooms, sweeping up the excessive mess that was left behind. We see Maul isolated in the night court, and she reaches down and picks up a piece of that silver confetti and begins to sing the nickel under your foot. The ceiling of the night court becomes even lower, representing the emotional burden <laughs> of Maul's own dire straits, but also the position of the middle class, who, as Larry Foreman says, is stuck like a sandwich between the top crowd pressing down and the bottom crowd coming up. As we move back, back to Dr. Specialist's office, we see the real business of society take place as Mr. Mister blackmails Dr. Specialist. We use one of the tracking in one panels in the glass gobo to create a split screen effect here, again changing our focus for this vignette. Mr. Mister's exaggerated shoulder structure and functioning QR code print advertise his corporate power. His steel plated platform dress shoes are a nod to his empire. Dr. Specialist's costume combines a nostalgic medical uniform with the modern x-ray modern print that's been abstracted. And then we get to Joe Worker, perhaps the most pivotal scene in the show where the societal machine finally breaks down. We meet Ella Hammer, who confronts Mr. Mister, as well as the audience, urging for change and calling for action. First, we see the costumed crew turning the gears of society, rotating the central machine as Ella Hammer sings downstage. One by one, the crew leave the treadmill of work 
and walked on stage, joined in silent solidarity by the members of the chorus dressed in exactly the same uniforms. This machine will not move again for the rest of the opera, even as we transition back into the night court. In the final scene, Mr. Mister confronts Larry Foreman on the upper levels the Liberty Committee takes over the middle level of the engine and forces Harry Druggist and Maul to remain at the bottom of society. Protesting workers enter from all sides, surrounding the scene like stormbirds and singing the title song, The Cradle Will Rock. Our staging of Mark Blitzstein's opera uses modern, functional, and unpretentious tools to cut through the artifice and tradition tr typically associated with opera. And we ask big questions. Who do the people work for? Does the engine of labor serve the many or just the one? Is the selling of one's efforts ever honorable or respectable? The vitality of our art is dependent upon our belief in it. A genuine belief that opera is a modern genre that can adapt and change to reflect our own times. The Cradle Will Rock is a product of our time. And we, as a team, cannot imagine telling this story without reflecting the events of the past year in our own communities. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Any questions for the team? Yes, sir. Great idea. I'm sure there are some composers and librettists who would be very interested in that. <laughs> Anyone? Any other questions? Come on, just one. It's okay, we'll be outside all we'll weekend. We'll be outside, and all right. We really love to talk to you guys about the work that you're doing in your own communities and how we can bring this message, whether it's through this production or other art, to your audiences and hear what conversations you are all having. And as Ben and I were talking about in the plane ride over, what do you want to do with your life and how is opera the tool that you're using to make it happen? So that's, those are our big questions and hopefully we'll see you outside to answer or ask a few of them. Terrific. The models? I think they are... Through Saturday, through Saturday, yeah, and it's it really is very high quality work out there. Uh, yes, ma'am. Not that I know of, not that I know of, but uh, I think they're all open to suggestions. <laughs> We'd be happy to talk to you. Um, I just wanted to give. Oh yes, another question. Yes. I think so. I mean, there's some, there's some very powerful ideas. There is a lot to think about. I just wanted to give uh, one last thank you to uh, Mid-Atlantic United Scenic Artists, the Union for Scenic Designers, uh, who are hosting a reception this evening for the finalists. So, it's terrific. So, thanks, all, thanks uh, to everyone again for joining us, and I'll see you outside by the models. Thank you.